How does Jesus prepare his disciples for what's going to happen next? That's what we're going to talk about in Mark 13. All right. We've been talking about parables and different ideas in the last chapter. We also had a lot of discussions about widows. Jesus is asked, hey, look at these wonderful stones, this wonderful building. Of course, they were without a temple ever since the Temple of Solomon was destroyed. So long ago, Herod did the gigantic task of rebuilding it. And it took, I think, over 40 years to rebuild. And he had all the engineering the Romans had. He had a massive manpower to get this done. And he collected money to build it. It must have been majestic to see. We know inside it wasn't producing fruit. But Jesus says, you see these great buildings? There will not be one stone left upon another that will not be thrown down. I mean, this would be hard to imagine. These stones were monstrously huge. They're going to be thrown down? Now, in some cases, when Jesus talks about the temple being destroyed, he sometimes will say this temple, meaning his body, and he'll come back in three days. This time, he is talking about the temple temple, and we're not going to get into Revelation. We'll do that some other day. But first of all, this happens in 70 AD. Essentially, there's an uprising, and the Romans had it. They kill many Jews, haul off most of them in slavery, and tear down the temple. There's not a piece left of it. It's destroyed in every way possible. This was something that was devastating to everyone that this happened. So he is telling them this is going to be something in the near future that's going to happen. But then he goes on to say about the signs of the end of age. That's what ESV calls this group of chapters. So he sits on the Mount of Olives, which again is across the way in this great ravine that kind of separates the two mountains. And he's with Peter, James, and John, and Andrew. And Andrew says, privately to him so not everyone can hear when are these things going to be happening and you know you could tell this is probably weighing on their minds that they've been thinking about it this long and instead jesus says something else he says don't let people leave you astray many people are going to come in my name saying i am yeah there's i am he which it's just the i am and will lead people away and we hear wars and rumors of wars. Don't be alarmed because all of this has to happen. Nation will be against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes and famines. So what are we talking about? Are we talking about now, like in 70 AD? What's interesting about it is we've had world wars. I mean, World War I, people thought it was the end of the world because it was many nations going against many nations. World War II, people again said, oh, well, maybe this is the end of the world. We have a clear antichrist. Also not the end of the world. But the idea of a world war or many nations going against nations or kingdoms going against kingdoms, that had never happened. So he says it's a birth pangs. So you may feel (laughs) this is the end. It's horrible. These terrible things are happening. But birth pangs are the beginning, right? Woman goes into labor. She starts to feel birth pangs at the beginning of the change, meaning the baby coming, not at the end. So then this almost turns more towards them. And this is where people will say there's the major apocalypse and the mini apocalypse. Because then he says, you are going to be delivered to consuls in the synagogue. You're going to be beaten by governors and kings. And the gospel must be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trials and hand you over to all the people they're going to hand you over, it's not you who is going to speak. Don't worry about what you're going to say, but the Holy Spirit is going to speak. And your brother, maybe your fellow apostle will be delivered over to death, or maybe your actual brother, the father of his child, the children will rise against parents and have them put to death. The children are going to call out the parents. We saw that in World War II in Nazi Germany, where the children were used to arrest their parents. But you will all be hated for my name, and the one who endures in the end will be saved. So I think that the first time he was talking about the birth pangs of the end of the entire age, where the wheat and the chaff are going to be separated, 
think he's talking now about what's going to happen to them, but he's trying to warn them and not to be worried about this. Don't be scared and don't be worried about what you're going to say. The Holy Spirit is going to give you what you're going to say. And we're going to always look at it too. There was a book I read and I mentioned it, one of my podcasts called The History of the End of the World. And it talked about every time people thought this was the end, you know, and obviously World War I and World War II were a part of it. But when we see hearts grow cold, we see the postmodern world, we see children turning in parents for whatever bad thoughts they have. And then we start to wonder, oh gosh, is this it? Is this the beginning of the birth pangs? We don't know. And then he talks about preaching to all nations. There are churches out there dedicatedly going through and trying to make sure the word of God is preached to all nations, printing the Bible in every language so that everyone can read the scriptures before the end time and have that chance to believe in Jesus, understanding his words. And he tells them that there are going to be people who lead astray. I wonder if some of these people are the very Christians who aren't very Christian, right? They are preachers who don't believe in God. They are producing an income. They're leaving believers away. All sorts of people come in Jesus' name. And they're not trying to bring people closer to God. They're trying to bring people closer to their goals. And he is telling you to stand firm, watch out for them, and don't let them lead you astray. So then Jesus says, when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it ought not to be, you are to flee to the mountains. This is going to be this plan, I think, that the Romans had to put the temple of Zeus where the temple of God is supposed to be. These things are going to happen and it's going to be terrible. And then it says, women who are pregnant and nursing infants, you know, people who can't flee very easily. I mean, you hope that it happens, not in winter, when it's harder to travel. These are going to be things that were put into place from the beginning of time. It says, quote, in ESV, for in those days, there will be such tribulations that have not been from the beginning of creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut the day short, no human being would be saved. There will be people that will go on and say, look, there's the Messiah or there's the Messiah. And all these false prophets are going to come and produce wonders and lead people guard. And he says, you should be on guard. So you know this. So again, we have to ask the question to ourselves, is he talking about 70 AD where the temple is going to be thrown down? The book of Acts has all the apostles fleeing, leaving. Most of them lived in other places. And Josephus even mentions that Christians left and fled to the east of the Jordan. People headed out. When I read this, it's funny because it seems like a mashing of two things. It is what happened in 70. And it also is what's going to happen at the very end. I think this what happened in 70 was a small glimpse into the horror. Sorry, that sounded grim of what's going to happen at the very end of time, that we're going to see things that we just don't think should be. And we're going to see something at the temple, at the temple, in the desolation of the temple that we never thought we were going to see from the beginning of time. And then when we think of Jesus coming, he will come back in glory and end everything that we've seen, that this is prophecy from Daniel, that we see this abomination, and that they should be on guard. It's where I think in general we think that we should live. Jesus lived yesterday, died today, and is coming back tomorrow. We would live pretty good lives if we're always prepared because we would always be looking out for the thing we shouldn't see. Regardless of this being a thing that happened in 70 AD or being a mention of the things that are to come, those are good words for everyone to be prepared. Don't fall astray. Don't listen to everyone that says they're coming in the name of Jesus, but instead be strong. Great words for all of us to live by. Then Jesus goes in, which is again why it's confusing of whether we're talking about now or later, but the coming of the Son of Man, when he comes in those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven. Obviously not falling, falling, but maybe we won't see them and the powers of heaven will be shaken. And then we're going to see the Son of Man, this is Jesus coming again, 
with great power and glory, and he will send his angels and gather the elects from the four winds and the ends of the earth from every place to the ends of heaven. So this is that part where Jesus had been talking about in the other parables, where he's going to separate the wheat from the chaff. All those parables of farming he gave us, where he's going to separate people at the very end. That's when it's going to happen. This is very clearly the very end. I think this left the impression to all the apostles this is going to happen before they died. I think that's, too, why we start seeing late all the Bible scriptures being written down. They believed that they were going to have time to talk to everybody, (laughs) meet with people, and get the message out because this was coming to an end before they were going to die. When they start to get older, when they start to get persecuted, they realize, I'm going to die before this happens. And that's when the words start going down on papyrus. And, and that's where it starts getting translated and disseminated to people because they realize they're going to die before this happens. I think initially they think they're going to see this happen. And again, the Romans would be impressed because they realize this isn't just some fluffy God. This isn't someone who is hugging it all out. This is a tough talk from someone who is warning people that the end is coming, whether it's the end of Jerusalem or it's the end of the entire age of mankind. This is coming to an end. And you have to think about this. You can't just take and think there's going to be Caesar after Caesar, governor after governor, and a new leader after new leader. Eventually, this comes to an end, and you're going to have to think seriously about what you believe after this. Mark is telling the Romans, you have to know what's going to happen. And so we know from all of this is that Jesus is going to collect everybody. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter if you got hauled off by the Romans or you fled to the east or wherever you are, God will find you and bring you back as he collects his own. But he also mentions that in some cases, Putting an end to this and shortening the period is a sign of mercy. This is going to be hard. Whatever happens to the people in Jerusalem in 70, it's shortened. Whatever is going to happen in the end of us, it is shortened too, because it is an act of mercy to keep us from what is actually going to happen. Boy, who thought it was a good idea to have a podcast where you're talking about the end of the world and having to interpret what's going on? I don't know. And so then Jesus explains the fig tree. And says that as soon as the branches start putting out leaves, you know the summer is near. And so when you see all these horrible things take place, you'll know heaven is near. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his words will never pass away, which means his words are promises, guarantees, talking about the end, that we'll see hope. We'll see the promise of the next age to come. And so we shouldn't look at this desolation as all bad, but we know it has to happen in order for all of us to get the promise of what God's been promising. And so when he talks about the generation not passing by, in 70 AD, that generation is still alive to see the end. When you think about it, Jesus is like 33-ish. We think that when Peter started, he was somewhere in his 20s or before his 20s, because he hadn't started paying the tax. And so in the 70s, he would have been, you know, not that old. He wouldn't have died of old age at that point if if he hadn't been killed for his faith, which we think is what happened to him. But talking about the generation, this generation is going to see the destruction of Jerusalem. The generation also, in the bigger sense, is the generation of mankind our time on earth. We will not all pass away. And when he comes back in glory, there will be people here, there will be believers here, and his angels will collect everybody. Talking about the end of Jerusalem as the mini apocalypse that's coming in 70 AD and talking about the big one and the kingdom to come that Jesus will always keep his promises no matter what passes away or what time it happens. And then he goes on to say, nobody knows when it is. Not the Son of Man, not the angels, only the Father knows. So just be awake. Keep watching. You know, be the 
the watchman at the tower so that you're always looking on it. He gives the parable about how a man goes away, leaving his servants in charge of the house. And the servants each have their job. Just because the guy who owns the house or owns the vineyard goes away doesn't mean all the things don't have to happen. They, of course, has to happen. And so that each of them, when they do their work, they stay awake, they do their job, because you don't know when the owner of the house is coming home. So if you just keep doing what you're supposed to be doing, you'll always be in good shape and everything will be fine. And that's where he says, in the evening, at midnight, when the rooster crows, in the morning, if he finds you asleep, trouble, right? Don't be in trouble. Just stay awake. He tells them all to stay awake. And again, the Romans would have gotten all of this. He gives the three different hours, the evening time from 6 to 9 p.m., midnight, which is 9 to 12 a.m., the rooster crows at 12 to 3 a.m., or at the dawn from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., where you're asleep. Those are the four watches. The Romans would have got that, and they would have understood through every watch time, you have to stay awake because the Son of Man could come back at any of those times. Whew. Well, that ends chapter 13. And boy, did we have an earful of everything that is coming to pass. What I'm going to meditate is on why did I pick to do a podcast on the... No, 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 we're not going to meditate on that. What I'm going to meditate is just about that idea of always being watching. It's so easy to get comforted in our lives so that we don't watch, right? We have plans for this week or next week or this year, or that vacation we're taking in a year from now. Are we always watching? I'm going to meditate a lot about that. And then I'm going to pray about the people, that they hear God's word before the end comes, that everyone from all nations, from all backgrounds, if anyone tells anyone that God is not for them, they're wrong. God is for everybody and that we have to be vigilant. We have to watch for God, but we also have to watch for false messiahs and for people who are going to bring the desolation. We always have to be on guard. And what I'm going to share with other people is that message that you don't know when the owner of the house is coming home. You're going to have to be prepared at all times. Don't just rest on your laurels or don't think you're going to do this on a different day or that day or the next day. Could come at any time. And we have to be prepared as servants of God to show that grace and mercy to everyone around us because the birth pangs will soon be over and the birth of the kingdom will soon be here. On that dire note, I'm just going to let you go and think about it. Please remember that you can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com and any prayer requests that you have. And I'm happy to talk to a Bible study group that you have and share anything that you'd be interested in. My experiences in Israel, my time as being a Jewish person who was also an atheist, and my dad, who was a very uh, hardcore atheist, but he came from a Christian background. And, and if you have any thoughts, you can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. Thank you so much for listening. Mm-hmm.